Welcome to this episode of Rattling the Bars. Recently, two political prisoners have been released. Uh, David Gilbert and Russell Maroon Schultz have served decades in the American prison system. So joining me today to give us an update on their situation and who they were is Charles Hopkins, better known as Mansa Musa, uh, who also was a former political prisoner. Uh, Charles, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, Ed. Okay, uh, Mansa, could you just talk a little bit about each one of those political prisoners first? Uh, you can start with whichever one you want. All right, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge that this is a good and a great opportunity for us to, to finally see some political prisoners released alive and not have to write their obituary and attend their funeral. Even though in the case of Maroon, he was released, which, which I'll start with, he was released uh, what they call compassion leave. But the concept of compassion leave coming out of prison is that you're going to die. They're not going to release you unless they emphatically know that you're going to die. I had research just for a guy when I was in the world prison system on compassion leave. And that's what it said. It said that the diagnosis is that the person that's being released is going to die. Now, in the case of Maroon, Maroon was a former Black Panther and a member of the Black Liberation Army back in the 60s and 70s. And during that period, he was involved with the party in Philadelphia primarily and on the East Coast. But during that period, you talking about, when we're talking about Philadelphia, we're talking about Rizzo, and we're talking about an all on out assault on the black community, bar none. We're talking about a, a, the police force that look, literally looked like the Gestapo during that time. And anybody that was poor, oppressed, and black in particular, they was being preyed on, they was being killed, and, they, and, and Rizzo took pride in that. Maroon had, had the mindset to become involved in the political activities that was going on in the Philadelphia uh, community at that time and on the East Coast. By becoming involved with the Black Panther Party during that era, it became apparent that he was going to be marked for death. And ultimately, he winded up in, uh, in prison because of uh, allegedly an assault on the police station in Philadelphia. So to say that somebody would attack the police station in Philadelphia is like saying somebody would attack the White House in the United States. But that being that, being that said, that he was locked up and given a life sentence. And then given a life sentence, he, was, he, was, he, served, he served 50 years. But more importantly, he served the majority of that time in solitary confinement for only one reason, and one reason, one reason, only, because of his political consciousness. And the fact that he was organizing the prison population throughout the Philadelphia to become more self-sufficient in terms of advocating for just laws around life without parole, just laws in terms of what we see a lot of things going on there, just laws in terms of how they look at juveniles and, and the mindset of juveniles to commit crimes when they committed them. He was, he was actively organizing around these things when they had put him on solitary confinement in order in an attempt to like silence his voice, which wasn't, as we can see, wasn't successful. And I'll get into that a little later on. Gilbert, on the other hand, uh, was involved with a group called the Weathermen. And it was really a, a, a multi-ethnic group. But back in the 60s, most people associated with being white radicals, but really it was a multi-ethnic group of, of uh, radicals, uh, people that had a perspective that armed struggle was necessary in order to uh, reverse some of the oppressive things that were taking place in America during that time. Mainly, it was the police. Police during that time was like an occupying force. So the we had during that period, not only we had we had the Puerto Rican National, we had Lolita Lebron and them. They had took over the capital and, and they took it over in the manner of uh, to try to establish that they wanted independence for Puerto Rico. They didn't they didn't go down there and march on it under the orders of the president and attack it. They went down there with the understanding like this to make a political statement that Puerto Rico should have their independence. The weatherman was also in that in that same regard was making political statements and making armed struggle statements or making impact statements on assaulting industries and, and industrial complex or industrial businesses to establish that capitalism and the fact that capitalism and imperialism was responsible for a lot of the oppression that was taking place in the poor and oppressed communities. So both of them, 
was released. Uh, Gilbert was was uh, involved with they call uh, a revolutionary uh, task force, and this was a group that got together to try to raise money to get political prisoners out and or to support any type of armed struggle that was taking place in the United States or anywhere in the world. And he was uh, the driver in, in what had to be a foil uh, attempt on Armour Khan. And he was given a, an exorbitant sentence of, of 75 years and the mayor Como, the governor Como commuted his sentence. And the people was incensed at this, but the reality was that they didn't do no more than what had been done to people throughout this history in this country, as we well see. They didn't, they didn't, they didn't storm the Capitol. They didn't shoot, you know, they didn't shoot Ronald Reagan under Jody, on the under with the infatuation with Jody Foster. They took and exercised their political right to arms struggle. Oh, uh, okay. So why why do you think first place? I know you said Russell Schultz was held for 50 years. How long was David Gilbert held for? And why were they held so long? Did they have support committees? Did they have community support? Why is all these decades in past? Yeah, Dave, I think David, and you can correct me, I think Dave was held for like 48 years. He was held for a significant, almost half, we look at half a century in any case, we're looking at a half a century of both of them being held. And they, in the terms of, they had political support and they mobilized uh, a political base uh, in terms of educating the people about their case and the fact it was being held so long, but because of their political ideology and the threat that they represented in terms of their ideology, in terms of what they were doing in the prison, when they was taking and educating our prisoners about their, their, the right to self-determination, the right to uh, equal justice, the right to a quality life, when they start educating our prisoners and having our prisoners start look at themselves in that same light, they start saying, okay, yeah, you know, I'm not here because I committed a crime. I'm here because a crime is being committed against me because I'm, I'm poor, I'm oppressed, and it's by design. So therefore, I'm here because that, and now I have a right to challenge this. When they started educating the population and when they started getting the community involved in terms of the, uh, uh, lawyers, radical lawyers, and have them become involved and start filing litigation and bring it to the attention of the, the criminal injustice system of the injustice that was taking place. That's why they was being held so long because the impact they was having on the change in the mindset of not only the prison, but society at large. And that's really why, and that's really why they were ultimately released. Shows being released, as I said, it, this, is, this is criminal because you, you, you knew that his health was being debilitated by virtue of him being in solitary confinement. You knew that this was premeditated. You knew that if you continue to leave him in the state, that he ultimately was gonna die, just like they ultimately hoping that Mumia Abu-Jamal would die. Case the same thing, the uh, misdiagnosis or ignoring the medical conditions of a person to get to the point where it becomes so fatal that all you can do then is just say, well, hey, uh, give him some whatever to hold him off until he die. Well, in the case of show. Okay, Mansa, tell tell me this then. That was like the late sixties and the early seventies. Um, why do you think they uh, chose to engage in armed warfare or armed struggle? Uh, what was going on in the world at that time? Internationally, we had like a, 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 a prairie fire of revolutionary activities taking place throughout the world. In national, on international level, we had all of Africa was in armed struggle. From, from the North to the South, we had the Vietnam, we had Vietnam that was taking place. We had all, we had in, in uh, Latin America, we had uh, most countries in Latin America, in, in uh, South America was waging some form of armed struggle because of the, the, and the growth of imperialism and the onslaught of imperialism and capitalism on these countries. In America, because of the things that was taking place on an international level, the society or people at large started protesting the war in Vietnam. We had the civil rights movement that was, that was here. We also had the, the protests against the war in Vietnam. And more importantly, we had the birth and the growth of the Black Panther Party that was taking the start to educate people around the right to self-defense. 
because in order to contain the, the population in the United States from protesting against the war in Vietnam and the social, economic, and political condition that we found ourselves in, we had the police was becoming more and more repressive in terms of responding to those things that they felt or that uh, the system felt was necessary to suppress. So that's what we had during that time. So in that during that period, during that period with this kind of uh, revolutionary upheaval, with this kind of international struggles taking place, we had an international perspective that was being developed uh, in this country. We had African Liberation Day. So when, we, you had, when you had African Liberation Day, people was being educated about uh, Zimbabwe and Zania, uh, Southwest Africa, the armed struggles that was taking place in there. We we we, we seen that Tanzania had gained their liberation. We seen that uh, uh, we seen on the heels of Patrice Lumumba being assassinated. So we seen firsthand that armed struggle was taking place worldwide, and the response from uh, radicals and militants and revolutionaries in this country was to find their place in that in that movement. Okay, and I and I would add to since both you and I lived through this uh, period, I would also add COINTELPRO and the repression that the American government through the FBI program uh, unleashed on liberation movements, black militant movements, and black and white radical organizers uh, that, that led to the death of a number of people. Uh, and uh, the repression and the Fred Hampton obviously is certainly a great example of uh, that uh, extrajudicial uh, murders that uh, the United States government uh, engaged in. Um, but there were so many other subtle kind of things. They tried to get uh, Stokely Carmichael assassinated. They uh, made several attempts to assassinate all our key uh, leaders and they assassinated a lot of the civil rights leaders, uh, including Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, there, there was a sense, like you say, of massive police repression and a sense that there would need to be a fight back. Well, tell me this, with this new round of protests after George Floyd uh, and uh, the Black uh, Lives Matter movement and whatnot, there's been a number, hundreds of people have been locked up from uh, these rebellions across the country. They are now getting time. They're political prisoners. Uh, is there something that organizers today can learn from the cases like David Gilbert and Russell Schultz uh, and the amount of time they spent and how those cases were managed. Can the organizers today learn something from those cases? Do you have any idea on that? Yeah, I think I think that they, what they really need to recognize, one, is that the threat is real and that this is a continuum of what you just espoused, you know, and the digress in that we had, you know, as you well know, in the party's headquarters, they had all the fallen pictures of all the fallen comrades they had killed and assassinated because of this onslaught of police. And this is this is the this is like the uh repackaging of the Cointel Pro. This is Cointel Pro 2021 in terms of uh identifying potential leaders, Black Lives Matter, uh co-opting them, uh identifying potential threats within these within these movements and locking them up. And then so what we need to do and what we need to learn from is that we know that if you protest, if you come out and protest against anything that's going on in this country, that this is the result, repression is going to be the result. So therefore we have to be in a position to be educated on our response. Now our response has to be there. We have to dial down in terms of organizing in the community. We have to get the community more involved in terms of the activities that, we, that we're involved in. It's not a matter of going down to Black Lives Matter Boulevard and protest. It's a matter of going into Black Lives Matter communities and organize the people to understand that they have certain rights. They have certain inalienable rights as the country said. It's certain inalienable and organize them around those things so that when we don't have to worry about having to make a massive protest down Black Lives Matter Boulevard, we got community control. We got control over the community. We got control over the police. We got control over all those things, those resources that 
these so-called, these local governments are responsible for, for giving us housing, uh, adequate housing, education, and medical. Because in, in, in the long and short of it, Eddie, it's because of the social conditions that people are responding. So we, we need to become more focused on and take a page out of the Black Panther Party in terms of creating programs what they call, we call survival program, but creating programs that's directly related to educating the people about the need to become more involved in controlling their own destiny. And that, by that, I mean controlling what goes on in their community. I just read, and I'll, and I'll cut on this point, I just read they had seven shootings in DC last night, two of them failing. This is like a continuation of what's going on in throughout this country in the black community. It's, it's internal violence that France Fanon spoke about. Okay. All right. So you, you yourself was a political prisoner. You came in jail, in the jail, you were young. You joined a, a Black Panther Party affiliate chapter in the prison that we had set up. Uh, and of course, you've been treated in, uh, like a political prisoner for how many years did you spend in prison? And what was it like? Well, I, I spent 48 years in prison and it was hell. I, I, I can't describe it no other kind of way. Uh, and only, the only reason why I survived was because I, the choice I made to, to join uh, the, the revolutionary, this, this revolutionary collective that you spoke of, the uh, Merlin Penn Intercommunal Survival Collective that, that you had helped organize. That was the only reason why I survived prison because once I got in prison and prison at that time was just starting to take a shift in terms of younger people was being locked up. So they had an onslaught on, on younger people in, in, uh, in the community during that time and drugs was prevalent in, during that time. So in order for me to survive, what because I had a life sense, in order for me to survive, I had to change my way of thinking. And this allowed me, to, when I joined this collective, it gave me a dialectical method of thinking. It gave me a, a way to look at conditions and analyze them and understand them and how to and understand what the understanding of how to influence and change them. So because of this, I was able to uh, go forward in terms of like raising prisoners' consciousness. Uh, I did, I like uh, Schultz, he did, I ain't do as much time in solitary confinement as he did, but I did, uh, at the end of my prison sentence, I did four and a half years in what they call supermax. Uh, so I'm recognized that, 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 uh, that mechanism that they use, but uh, what it allowed me to do at the end, it allowed me to be able to have clarity of thought and be able to keep a uh, focus on maintaining a certain attitude about my role in the struggle and my, my environment and the necessity to maintain some type of presence in, our, in the struggle for our people's liberation. So, okay, so, you know, it's, it's good that we can celebrate, you know, the release of Russell Schultz and the release of David Gilbert. But this, uh, you know, Sunday out there, Cola, there's a, 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 a ton, it's still a dozen political prisoners uh, or more. And now, of course, there's a new round of political prisoners with these last protests. What can people do individually or collectively to help gain the freedom of these political prisoners or prisoners of war? I think, you know, like I recall when, uh, and uh, that's a good point because I remember that um, uh, Anthony Biden, Luther King, uh, back in the back in the seventies, we had we had to, we had made a call to take the problem of prison to the United Nations and to put the United States on 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 blast about the fact that they was using that we're a political prisoner, we're prisoners of war, that they're using our right to protest and criminalizing it in order to give us this in you know, in this long, these long length of time. I think what we need to look at, and people need to look at in general, is that the, the prison industrial complex, mass incarceration, is something that's being used to control and contain people. More importantly, it's being used to prop up rural America. When you look at rural America, is, is, is where most of the prisons are, are in there. So this is where you have your new plantation. We need to, people need to recognize that uh, they need to start getting being organized around on, on one level on, on the political level in terms of holding legislators responsible for the monies that they're allocating to prop up these rural counties by putting these prisons in them 
Two, they, they need to, we need to organize, people need to get organized around understanding that the so-called, what they call in, uh, we call political prison, they, they criminalize. And that's why both Schultz and Gilbert was locked, stayed locked up so long was because they, they criminalized their, their activity as opposed to making it what it was, a political activity, and they have a right. Case in point, Eddie, the guy, one of the people that stormed the Capitol in Washington, he was over DC jail, and he had got canceled now. And he he told the judge he protested. When he protested, they responded to him. And as a result, responded to him, the federal courts came in and sanctioned DC jail, moved all the federal prisoners that was being held in DC jail to Lewisburg. And they took and get put with they took the the dude that, that protested that was Trump's uh, ally, they took and sent him home on home detention. So he, because of his, because he took a position and he had the support of a right wing group, he was able to get the full poverty of his rights. But everybody else was sent to Lewisburg because of the abuse of the DC jail. So we need to, we need to really be able to take a position. Or we need to take a position like that. We need to take a position and hold politicians, everybody accountable for people that they're, they're saying that's criminal that are political, they, they, they committed a crime, they, they committed an act, they was charged with an act. Uh, we know Cointel Pro had a lot to do with a lot of things going on with it. So that we need to get people to recognize and get involved with, contacting these, these networks that these groups are involved, these people are involved with, and supporting them even in the form of finance or freedom on the ground. Okay, all right, so thank you for that um, overview. And, um, Hope to see you again uh, in uh, future programs. Yeah, uh, Eddie, I was I was telling the person about rattling the bars and where it came from. I remember when we was locked up, we was on South Wing, and to get the the guards' attention when somebody was sick, we were bang on the we were bang on the doors and rattle the bars to get their attention. And we're calling for people. This is what we need to do now. We need to rattle the bar. We need to shake these bars and get people to recognize that. It's a social justice taking place in society, and you all need to get involved. We need to get your attention to put to get involved with our struggle. And that's actually the purpose of this program. Uh, and thank you for joining this episode of Rattling the Bars.